these are some of the people involved that we have uh, in the United States that have um, parent medicine fellowships. So please keep in mind that there's many opportunities in this country. Of course, we love our own, but all of you are our friends and have great programs. So we entice the fact that whoever you train and whoever we train are going to be our brothers and sisters in arms. So please keep in mind, all of you who are on here and in, 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 in residency, that there's great opportunities to add yourself to a group of people who are the up and coming. The ASA has uh, put together a perioperative center medicine home. Sorry, Dan, I'm taking some of your time, but I'm doing this PSA. And it is going well. And there is an ad hoc committee being formed. And it is definitely a function of the American Society of Anesthesiology is taking this seriously. So this would be one of those things that's up and coming and new. Uh, it's not up and coming here anymore because we've been doing it for a while, but it's new in a lot of parts of the country. So please keep that in mind. It's a great opportunity. I think I'm going to be able to introduce Dr. Shams, who I first met actually as a fellow who is a um, now a faculty member for a couple of years. He's been very actively involved in our program, both by training residents and fellows included in his duties, I believe, are he's the journal club head. He has been um, an instrumental part in training other faculty and residents and fellows. We've done a couple of uh, ultrasound workshops. He was involved in the erector spinae workshop. He was inv involved more recently in the parasternal workshop and many others. He is a wonderful teacher. He is uh, known to be a kind, gentle soul for the patients. Not my words, Dr. Shams, some patients' words. He has uh, been a wonderful addition, and uh, he is one of our many faculty here that we are proud of. So for all of you on the outside, he's still ours. Do not take him. Please welcome Dr. Dan Shams. Thank you, Ted. Um, thank you for everybody for joining us. I am at one of our outpatient facilities, not at home like I plan to be. So we're going to try this and make sure that I can share this here. Prior to coming to Vanderbilt, I had actually personally not had much experience with methadone, but in the last two years, um, I've been using it rather extensively in the operating rooms. Um, and I'm to what I find to be good re results. And I started doing that because I started looking at a little bit of the evidence uh, after reading a paper that I'll quote here as well. I'm hoping to kind of walk us through a little bit of the history of methadone, very briefly on the pharmacology of methadone, talk about what the current evidence is, and then hopefully how it can be implemented, um, although you'll find that it is certainly lacking in some places. Um, I have no disclosures to make. And like I said, as far as objectives go, um, hope to, again, discuss the history of methadone, review the pharmacology briefly, look at the literature, and then see what the future is, particularly in the era of ERS. Uh, as far as the history of methadone go, and it's a bit of an interesting history. It was discovered originally in World War II in Germany around the time they were having morphine shortages and they were examining uh, other opportunities for pain control. It, it was initially named uh, dolophine, which there's an urban myth surrounding that, that it's it was named after Adolf Hitler. Um, and there were reports at one point of a dolophine, again, playing into that trope. But it's more likely that it was a contraction of the... Latin words of dolor finis, literally meaning the pain end. And you can see to the right that uh, dolphine is the original name. Whenever the Allies uh, won World War II, a lot of the patents that were developed with it from uh, Germany um, were essentially divvied up between the Allies. And uh, methadone became approved as an analgesic in 1947 in the U.S. But probably the exposure that most laymen as well as uh, providers have with it is its use in methadone maintenance treatment, which started in the 1960s. I apologize. At some point, you will hear this walkie-talkie go off. As far as the pharmacology of methadone goes, very lipid-soluble, and a lot of that has to do, if I went back to the first slide, you could see the photo. There's a lot of ben, uh, benzene rings associated with it. That high lipid solubility leads to rapid redistribution. And when we look at the papers later on, uh, you'll see that effect in, as the initial studies showed it in real time. Mixtures that are readily available to us are also generally racemic, both RNS methadone, our methadone accounting primarily for the mu opioid effects and S methadone accounting for the uh, NMDA effects. I wasn't really able to find it. There are also SNR, SNRI effects. They There are it does stop the reuptake of both serotonin and norepinephrine. I'm not sure which enantiomer causes that. 
If we look at the pharmacokinetic parameters, and again, this is after oral administration, which is where a lot of the data does tend to lie. Things definitely want to focus on is particularly the half-life, which is one of the reasons to utilize methadone. It's the long acting effect, but that range does have a lot of variability, um, as well as the protein binding, because it is very highly protein bound. When we talk about the metabolism of methadone itself, it's what broken down through the P450 system, specifically CYP3A4 and 2B6, the hepatic metabolism, but both of its primary metabolites are considered to be generally inactive. Um, and then it's eliminated primarily renally um, as well as uh, via the feces. And that's one of the reasons, if I go back a slide, you can look and see that the half-life can be influenced by urinary pH. I certainly don't remember this table, although I used to have it memorized back when I was studying for step one. Um, as I'm sure many of you did, it's more important for all of us just to be aware that when patients are on a lot of these medications, that there can be some interaction with methadone, um, particularly inhibition of the metabolism of methadone leading to longer duration of action. So it's not uncommon to see that. And a lot of these medications are medications that either we give regularly, such as haloperidol, or they're very common for patients to be on, uh, like a lot of our uh, SSRIs, uh, fluoxetine, peroxetine, sertraline, all of those. And those also, many of them also have an effect on prolonging QT, which methadone does as well. Again, something for everyone to be cognizant of uh, if we're going to start utilizing methadone more frequently. Pharmacology of methadone, as I mentioned before, there's mu opioid agonism, which we're aware of, which is a lot where a lot of its primary nociceptive action comes from. There's also NMDA receptor antagonism, very similar to ketamine, and there have been studies that have shown that the binding capacity is similar to ketamine as well. However, the, when they studied bundling ketamine versus just doing methadone by itself uh, in complex spine surgeries, they actually found that bundling ketamine with methadone should statistically less opioid consumption, so that there is definitely some effect there of putting them together. And then there's also, as I mentioned, serotonin, norepinephrine uptake inhibition that happens, which can possibly explain some of the alterations in mood that can happen for patients who receive it. Now, some of the difficulty that often comes around with ketamine is what happens with dosing in MMEs? What does it really mean? Some of the values that we generally find are for, oh, I don't, I'm not sure if this is large enough, um, for oral methadone, it depends on the actual dose that patients are on. The conversion factor changes whether they're on lower doses of 1 to 20 milligrams per day or higher doses of 21 to 40, 41 to 60, or greater than 61 to 80. The oral methadone to IV methadone ratio tends to be something like 2 to 1 or 1 and a half to 1, depending on which sources you're looking at. Uh, and although methadone is very strong, it is does not necessarily bind to the mu opioid super tightly like something like buprenorphine does. So it's it's not a great drug to use as an adjunct for someone who comes in on buprenorphine. It's somewhere kind of middle of the pack. It's It binds tighter than oxycodone does, but nowhere near where the lot of buprenorphine sufet will do. And as I mentioned, the review of the pharmacology will be very brief um, because I really do want to do my best to spend the time on what evidence there is and what evidence there isn't. Before I fully get into the evidence, I want to backtrack a little bit and talk about where we've come. Over the last two decades, overall opinions have kind of shifted as to whether opioids are good, opioids are bad, should we try to not do any opioids at all? Um, in the early 2000s, there was shifting federal guidance that led to increased opioids by practitioners, which we're all aware of the consequences of that, leading to the opioid crisis, which swung a lot of the sentiment away from opioids and led to the idea of opioid-free anesthesia. Now, there seems to be a little bit of a pushback and that as well, pushing for balanced anesthesia or opioid reductive anesthetics. This is kind of where I initially started reading a little bit more about methadone. Um, in April of 2021 in anesthesiology, there were three papers published, all are two papers, one RCT, one narrative review, which is this one, and then uh, in an editorial uh, by Dr. Karish discussing opioid-free anesthesia versus opioid sparing approaches, and then also where the evidence for that truly lies. In this narrative review, they came to the conclusion that there's just a lack of data to support opioid-free strategies rather than opioid-sparing strategies overall. 
And uh, not to say that opioid sparing strategies or opioid free strategies are not viable, but that they don't necessarily even prevent persistent opioid use. So we should be focusing primarily on using strategies that are going to allow us to minimize opioid use both intraoperatively and postoperatively um, that can be adapted to individual patient situations and surgeries. From that editorial by Dr. Parrish, uh, one of the quotes that I particularly enjoyed was that opioid free could be feasible, but it doesn't appear to be logical or beneficial, at least for most patients. Again, doesn't mean that it's not beneficial at times, just doesn't mean that it's beneficial most of the time. Um, and developing regimens to give that maximum pain relief with the minimal side effects, ideally with long lasting benefits. And one of the things he mentioned within that article was in using things like methadose and opioid sparing opioid. Now, at the time, I didn't know that Dr. Kerr had also written many papers on the use of methadone prior to this, uh, but that did definitely come up in my research. Where is the evidence for methadone currently? From September of 2019 to February of 2020, there were three separate publications that published either systemic reviews or clinical reviews talking about, again, here's that word, feasibility of regular intraoperative methadone. I think the word feasibility was probably just stuck in my head at that point when I was making this PowerPoint. In September of 2020, there was a really well-written uh, clinical review by Dr. Murphy, followed by December, uh, I'm sorry, uh, 2019, um, December of 2019 uh, by Dr. D'Souza and Payne, a systematic review and meta-analysis, and then another systematic review and meta-analysis in ANA uh, in February of 2020, uh, with also some trial sequence uh, analysis looking at the validity of the data. I'm going to use these three studies as kind of the backbone of the discussion that I'm going to have, while also going into the papers themselves, the individual RCTs that are available to show where the data is coming from. The first thing I want to address is dose and the duration of effect. One of the earliest studies looking at this was by Gorley et al., and they looked at blood concentrations over time after patients were uh, put to sleep. They placed additional IVs, made sure that they were able to draw blood, methadone was given, and blood concentrations were drawn at specific times. And they continued that post-operatively, and what they decided was the minimal effective concentration was the average time where patients asked for pain medications post-op. And they found that to be at about 30 nanograms per milliliter. And intraoperatively after methadone was given, when patients were not relaxed, they looked at when did patients begin to breathe again. And they found that once the blood concentrations on average got below 100 nanograms per milliliter is when that started happening. So they repeated this later with more painful surgeries, and they actually found that that minimum blood effect was a little bit higher. So we're looking at somewhere between 30 to 60 nanograms per milliliter when of the minimum effective blood concentrations should be. Now, this is not from that article. This is taking some of that data and putting it in a, what I consider to be slightly better format, but using similar data, uh, looking at blood concentrations of methadone whether you're given 5, 10, 20, or 30 milligrams. You can see that there's initially a very quick upswing, followed by, again, that rapid redistribution that we mentioned based off of is uh, highly lipophilic nature, um, and then a kind of linear downswing once everything is out of that primary compartment, the central compartment. If you look at the zoomed in photo on the top right, you'll see that for the 5 and 10 milligram one, they fall below that 30 nanogram per milliliter minimal effective dose relatively quickly. And that seems to be supported by some other data showing that lower doses of methadone doesn't have that long duration that we associate with methadone. That has a much shorter three to four hour, possibly maybe even half an hour to three to four hours durations, much similar to Dilaudid than to the long acting methadone that we're expecting. However, if you go to those larger doses of 20 to 30 milligrams, that's when you find that the, the analgesic duration starts to extend into the 24 to 36 hour range and possibly even further. Regardless of which dose you give, if you look at that top insert, top right insert, you'll find that almost all of those, again, in, um, these are simulated blood values, the concentration falls below that minimal, uh, the, I'm sorry, the amount needed for significant respiratory depression, which is about 100 nanograms per milliliter within half an hour. Um, and if you 
want to be more conservative and call that about an hour, that means that, again, for most people within the first 30 to 45 minutes, you're going to be outside of that significant respiratory depression range. The second part that I want to talk about is, is when should you give methadone? At least at Vanderbilt, in some of our protocols, we find that people will give five milligrams initially, and then if they feel like more is needed, they'll titrate in another five milligrams for 10 milligrams total during the case. There was actually a study done by Porter et al. that looked at the effect of pre-incisional versus post-operative methadone um, on opioid requirements. One group of patients got a spinal, so they did not feel anything, and then after surgery, before the spinal wore off, got methadone, and the other group got methadone up front. Uh, they all received methadone PCAs post-operatively, and then they looked at what that usage looked like. They also, similar to the previous study by Gorlay, they looked at the blood concentrations and calculated clearance rates and made sure that there was no difference between the two groups. They found that those who received the post-operative methadone had actually a nearly a two-fold increase in their PCA demand rate, but there was no difference in the clearance rate or the plasma methadone concentration at the time that they were hooked up to PCAs between the two. You can see that here in the first line, you have the concentration of methadone at the point where the patient groups were hooked up to the PCA and they found no significant difference. And they looked at the clearance rate at the bottom that was calculated through, through repeated blood concentrations of methadone taken. They found no significant difference. The biggest significant difference was found at the demand rate of methadone required, which was nearly half for the group who got methadone pre-incision versus post-operatively before spinal had worn off. They also found a difference in the blood concentrations the morning after surgery, but that could be explained by the higher demand rate. And so meaning despite that higher concentration of methadone in the morning that they were utilizing much more during the night. Methadone's also been studied in multiple different types of surgeries. It's been studied in spine surgeries where they found in some studies about a 50% decrease in opioid requirements and, 50, and significantly decreased pain scores at 48 hours with overall higher satisfaction with their pain management. You can see in this graph on the left, these are from the same study, there was a methadone arm and a sufentanil arm. And they found that overall, the methadone arm had lower pain scores, but it was only statistically significant at the 48-hour mark. And they also looked at the postoperative opioid requirements, and they found that for the methadone group, it was significant at every point which they looked, which was at 24, 48, and 72 hours. There was an almost 50% uh, decrease in opioid requirements from the methadone uh, arm as compared to the sufentanil arm. The same was studied with gynecological or obstetric surgeries, and they found overall lower pain scores in the 40, first 48 to 72 hours and lower post-operative opioid requirements during those times as well. Uh, this is a much older surgery, as you can tell, from, or much older study, as you can tell from the graph. I believe this one was from the 90s by Chu et al. Uh, and they found that they looked at the number of injections of morphine because they were actually giving IM morphine at the time, and they found that there were... 10 patients within the methadone group that did not require any postoperative opioid injections after 48 hours, whereas uh, there were none within the group who got morphine um, intraoperatively who did not require postoperative, again, IM morphine injections. When they also looked at the pain scores, um, overall pain scores, as well as the worst pain scores, they also found a statistically significant difference between the group who got methadone intraoperatively and the group that got morphine intraoperatively in favor of the methadone group. Finally, it's also been studied in cardiac surgeries and where they also found decreased postoperative opioid requirements with reduced pain, pain scores almost 40% during the first three days and then also overall higher patient satisfaction. Um, if you look at this graph, you can see to the right that almost every single point, there's a significant difference between the methadone group and the hydromorphone group, whether that is in PECU pain scores during the first 24, 48, or 72 hours or overall, um, as well as in the total number of pain tablets. And each of those pain tablets are 10 milligrams of hydrocodone at every point except within the first 24 hours. Um, you will see a statistically significant difference favoring the methadone group.
Now, if we take a step back from the studies themselves and look at the meta-analyses, meta-analyses tend to find the same data when they look at all the studies grouped together. When looking at pain at rest and pain at movement in 24 hours, tend to favor the methadone group. The same is true at 48 hours, and the same is true at 72 hours. However, when they look at the trial sequence analysis of this, uh, they found that the only data set that both met their criteria as well as met the number total number needed, so the required data size, um, was pain at rest at 24 and 48 hours. All of the and from that, they don't believe that any additional data will change what that shows that methadone is favored, uh, will decrease pain compared to traditional opioids at the 24 and 48 hours at rest. For movement, 24, 48 hours, as well as pain at rest at 72 and uh, pain movement at 72 hours, uh, they found that there is a statistically significant difference favoring methadone use and that methadone does cause those reductions in pain. However, the studies were not large enough or did not follow the patients long enough in all of the studies to say that there are no more studies needed in order to prove that. When the meta-analyses looked at patient satisfaction, it also tended to favor methadone. However, that data, given the size and the sample sizes overall of the studies that actually looked at this, as well as what they were powered for, they found to be low evidence. The same was true for postoperative respiratory depression. None of these studies were powered to look at these rare adverse events. Um, however, they did not find a difference uh, in the ones that did look at it between traditional narcotics or traditional opioids, uh, short-acting opioids such as dilated or morphine and methadone itself. They also, when they looked at the observational retrospective investigations, they found no episodes of adverse respiratory events. When they looked at the pooled data of everything, they found no difference in respiratory depression, uh, rates of hypoxemia or time to extubation, um, except in one large retrospective survey study that did not match to other narcotics. In that, they actually did find a relatively high rate of most of 2% rate of reintubation for patients who got methadone. But again, they, they didn't actually compare to other narcotics, so it was difficult to say which data and how that would compare to patients who did not receive methadone but received traditional narcotics. The biggest drawback to this, which is where a lot of the fear comes from methadone and respiratory depression, is that you have respiratory depression secondary to methadone. Naloxone is required, and not just injections of Narcan, but possibly an infusion of Narcan, which for most places would buy those patients uh, a stay in the ICU. As far as the evidence shows currently, there is no difference in that incidence of respiratory depression. The other big fear that many people have or concern that many people have is the risk of QT prolongation and arrhythmias, specifically torsades, uh, for patients who are receiving methadone. First of all, it has not been studied. We don't have significant evidence to say what the effect of a single dose of IV methadone does to QT prolongation. Has been studied, does not show a higher incidence of adverse cardiac events favoring avoiding methadone or favoring methadone. They just show no difference. There was, there have been some subgroup analyses in other studies that were not looking at methadone use, but that methadone was used. And they found that just all surgical and anesthetic factors in patients can lead to QT prolongation in about 50% of patients. These were patients who had gotten a preoperative uh, EKG and also received one in the PACQ. However, they found that none of those patients experienced torsades or significant arrhythmias, and that in all of those patients, those 50% who had QT prolongation in the PACU, it was resolved by post-op day one. That's not to say that a single dose of IV methadone can't increase your QT, uh, we certainly know that it can. Some data that I've seen says it can increase it by 20 to 30, but the significance of that is just unknown. Some of the other side effects, such as PONV, bowel function, have been looked at, but not significantly. Um, when they looked at the incidence of PONV, they found no difference between methadone and other narcotics, but again, this was considered to be 
low quality evidence as far as the meta-analyses were concerned. And the bowel function study, there's only one study looking at methadone that actually looked at return of bowel function. In that study, they did not find a difference between the methadone group and the non-methadone arm. However, this was a small study and there was only one. Theoretically, given that methadone is also a serotonin uh, and norepinephrine uptake inhibitor, you could have the possibility of serotonin syndrome when these are co-administered. However, there have been no reported cases of this. It is always something to be cognizant of and aware of, particularly if you have patients who are on combinations of other drugs like monoamine oxidase inhibitors, which have fallen out of favor for the most part, um, or who are on multiple medications that could cause serotonin syndrome. But it's not something that has been reported thus far as being of true concern. One thing that I definitely wanted to mention as I'm sitting here in our ambulatory surgery center, um, where we do not use methadone, um, is that methadone has been studied to some degree in ambulatory surgery. Uh, there have only been two studies that I know of. This is one of them where they actually did a dose finding study that I wanted to make sure that I included, um, both of which showed the validity of utilizing it. But again, the total number of patients, I think, was about 40 per arm, not large studies. Um, but in, in this particular study, this was a randomized, double-blinded study. It was a dose finding study. They wanted to look at the efficacy and safety of methadone for ambulatory surgery. They initially tried 0.1 mg per cake ideal body weight, and they decided on ideal body weight because uh, there can be such variation in weights, as we all know, based from total to what ideal is. Um, the average of that ended up being about 6 milligrams. And what they were hoping to find is that they wanted to see a difference between the intraoperative opioid consumption and the PACI opioid consumption. When they did 0.1 milligrams, they did not find that for the PACU. They found no statistical significance. So they increased to 0.15 mg per kg ideal body weight, which ended up being an average of about 9 milligrams. At that point, they did see a statistically significant difference between intraoperative and postoperative opioid uh, consumption, um, comparing methadone to traditional short-acting opioids, and therefore did not increase the number at all. Postoperatively, all patients were sent home with a 30-day home diary. They were asked to record pain, opioid use, and side effects daily. When this data was looked at postoperatively, they found that those who got methadone um, had less in-hospital opioid use, right, which we can see here. Um, they had less pain at rest, uh, which I do not have that table up there. And they also used fewer opioids pills than the controls when they went home. However, the biggest takeaway from that study was probably that there is still a significant overprescription of narcotics um, for people to go home with because the vast majority of the patients did not utilize anywhere near the number of opioid pills that they were sent home with. And uh, almost all of them had significant numbers of those left over. I really want to include this saying that it has been studied. There does seem to be an appropriate safety profile within it. But again, this is a small study. I've alluded to a lot of these limitations of the studies as we've kind of moved along, uh, but I wanted to spell them out so we all know where we're starting from. First and foremost, there's a lack of large randomized double-blinded studies. A lot of these studies are single-blinded. Most of them are not very large. Only two of them have greater than 100 patients per arm. And when the studies were reviewed within the meta-analyses, some of the studies were deemed as being low quality based off of biases that were found within the studies themselves. In addition to that, in all of these studies, there's a lot of inconsistency in the dosing and the methods of the rescue opioids. Whether patients were placed on PCAs, whether patients were giving only oral medications, whether MMEs were calculated, uh, and what those opioids were which makes it difficult to come to significant conclusions when trying to look at the data pooled together. Because the sample sizes are smaller, they also, as I mentioned, aren't, weren't powered to look at these rare adverse events. And we, they're rare in the baseline population, so it's hard for us to say in these much smaller cases how often it's happening and is it happening more often than using traditional opioids. 
The last thing that none of the studies really address is, is what is the cost of methadone use? The pharmacoeconomics of it have not been looked at. We are saying that methadone is an opioid sparing opioid, meaning that even if the upfront cost is higher as it appears to be, I think when I, I tried to Google it and see what the price of methadone is, what I came back at is what I think it was almost... 400 for 20 cc's of one make per cc so if you know 20 dollars for 10 milligrams uh iv um whereas the lot it is significantly less than that but if in the post-operative period you are saving on opioid costs you are saving on nursing costs because patients have less pain so they require less attention if you are have decreased length of stay if you have decreased side effects then maybe the upfront costs is worth the in that same vein is where the limitations are are some of the questions that I certainly would like to see answered. A lot of the first of these are really just related to dosing. What is the optimal dosing? Many of the studies don't discuss what the dosing is based off of when they're weight based. Is it based off of total body weight? Is it based off ideal body weight? Um, And some of them just give a standard dose of 20 milligrams behooves us to come away understanding what is the ideal way of dosing methadone. A lot of the studies don't include patients who are opioid tolerant. What do we do for those patients? Do they require more or should we give them the same amount intraoperatively, but instead give them more postoperatively in order to attain the same effect because we don't want to make sure that we don't over-narcotize them? What about the elderly population? The elderly population is one population base that we could certainly say that we probably should give less methadone to, as the clearance of methadone does tend to decrease as age goes up. There's one case report from the 90s where an 80-year-old lady, um, 80-year-old patient received, I think, 30 milligrams of IV methadone, which ended up being about 0.7 mg per kg for her, and she was asleep for eight days, um, which certainly none of us want. And then what about dosing in the morbidly obese? Do we we know that this is a patient population that's more prone to sleep apnea? Are they also and also more uh, sensitive to narcotics? But if we're saying that the initial respiratory depression phase is very short and thus they that should not affect them when they wake up, uh, when the surgery is over, but then that they would require less opioids afterwards, decreasing the risk of PACI or postoperative respiratory depression. But we don't know because, again, the morbidly obese are often not included within these studies. However, given our population size, at least at Vanderbilt in Tennessee, Middle Tennessee, um, that's certainly something that I would like to see some data of as to what do we do in those situations. Um, and then finally, the comparison of adverse and traditional opioids, which I mentioned, should really come as a no-brainer. The overall major takeaways I had when delving through this data, uh, besides that there's not as much data as I would love there to be, is that methadone probably requires larger doses than we traditionally use to get that longer duration of action. The 10 milligrams that we're giving upfront or in divided doses is unlikely to have the significant duration that we wanted to have, although the ambulatory study did seem to hint that despite there being lower doses, um, it does seem to have some benefit even over 30 days. The other point is that op- Methadone is probably really only opioid sparing if you give it pre-incisionally. And that may have to do with its NMDA activity, preventing any kind of, I hesitate to say centralization of pain, but preventing any kind of wind-up phenomenon that may occur by giving it pre-incisional versus post-operatively. From the meta-analyses there and the statistical analyses that they did, it was easy to come away to say that there's enough evidence to support Methadone does reduce pain scores at rest um, at 24 and 48 hours compared to traditional opioids. We need to look at larger studies to cement its use in various surgeries and in various patient populations. And the data that we currently have, while low-level evidence doesn't appear to show that it contributes significantly to things like respiratory depression or cardiac phenomena, but doesn't mean that those don't exist or those risk factors aren't or those risks aren't present in those who already have those risk factors, um, but it does not appear to do that significantly more than traditional opioids do. The last thing that I wanted to talk about before opening the floor to questions was just my personal experience over the last two years, which I hinted at to some degree. As I mentioned prior to coming to Vanderbilt, I had really never utilized, I had never really utilized 
methadone at all. However, in the last two years or so, I've been using it significantly in the operating rooms. Um, I would say in, if I'm in the main ORs, I'm more often than not using it every single day, um, except when I'm in uh, joint rooms, which are getting spinals and getting zero neck intraoperatively, which is a situation for opioid-free anesthesia. Um, and the dosing that I'm giving, when I initially started off, I was very hesitant to give more than five or 10, and that's all I was giving intraoperatively. Once I started combing through the data, I definitely started giving larger doses, and I have certainly given, uh, regularly give 20 milligrams. And there are times where I've given more in significantly larger, longer surgeries, or those with uh, significant preoperative narcotic use or narcotic dependence. At least personally, I, I have no idea what my N is. I know of one of my patients who required Narcan. And when I looked back, uh, I had misdosed the patient based off the weight. And the surgery ended uh, an hour earlier than it was expected to end. The patient received 160 uh, Narcan, was never put on a drip, was watched in the PACU for four hours uh, before leaving the PACU, never had any episodes of respiratory depression in the PACU, just did not breathe prior to Narcan intraoperatively. But once Narcan was given, 40, 40, 40, 40, um, had no other episodes of respiratory depression, did not require any additional oxygen in the perioperative period. I find that methadone with ketamine does seem to work very well. Uh, the methadone wake up is tends to be very smooth. I've utilized it in pretty much every surgical uh, subspecialty that I regularly am a part of. A lot of ortho surgeries, whether that's ortho trauma or plant ortho, uh, ENT surgeries, gynecological surgeries, colorectal surgeries. I do not do cardiac or thoracic. I've used them in spine surgeries, and we regularly use them in spine surgeries anyway within our protocols. And I do, I do tend to find that completely anecdotally, the patients are much more comfortable than those patients where I don't utilize methadone or didn't previously. I, I don't have anything else in the PowerPoint. I'm happy to oh yeah, open up to questions. And I see that there's something in the chat. Let me swing on over there. 520, which surgeries are included in the meta-analysis? Um, in those meta-analyses, Christina, it, it is most of the surgeries that I discussed. It's primarily spine, primarily uh, gynecological and primarily cardiac. And that's just because those are the RCTs that have been done. Those uh, meta-analyses, there was a lot of overlap between them, as could be expected um, between all three of them, what they discussed, because they they had stringent um, guidelines of what they were looking for, and they were really looking for RCTs. And those RCTs have been limited for the most part. The ones that had good evidence were, were within the guidelines they were looking for to those subspecialties. So, Dan, the other question in there, so you don't have to Do include methadone. There, is, is, yeah, yeah, use I it mean, in ambulatory cases. I think that the data seems to support it. I have given it to patients who are receiving ambulatory surgery. I think it would be hard for us to take the data that we currently have and say that it's safe for every ambulatory surgery as much as I want to, um, particularly because probably the place where this would be best served is within our our bariatric surgery protocols, and we are already using methadone in those patients, and I know that there's a push to move those patients to leave earlier. I'd like to look at what our data looks like since we have started to give methadone more regularly within those cases. I don't think we've had any cases of respiratory depression uh, in the postoperative period, as far as I'm aware, and they've been monitored now for the past six to 12 months after getting methadone with no issues. So it, it very likely is safe. We just don't have the data. So Dan, with, without reference to the fact that Jen asked that question, um, Dr. George, Alex is on the call. And I guess since he could maybe, if he's ever looked on the bariatric side, I'm not sure he has, but if he has, maybe he can tell us later, if not now. But no, yeah, I'm nope. here. I've been, sorry, I've been, uh, I'm over at MCE, so I've been in and out. Um, that was a selfish question of mine, was to know the limitations of methadone in the ambulatory setting, because I yeah. think there's a, a world in which bariatric surgery goes to am the ambulatory setting. Um, and I've been hesitant to suggest it, to protocolize it, um, because of its long tail and the very likelihood that these patients have um, concurrent obstructive sleep apnea um, so, so I've tried to look it up, um, 
I think Dan, you probably, and again, sorry if you've already said this. I think there's That's evidence right. to suggest that it's safe in obesity, and I've looked that up specifically, and it's safe in ambulatory surgery. But is it safe in obesity and ambulatory surgery? Like, I don't, I'm a little hesitant to say that. I, again, well, I, what I, he I, did, I don't think we have the evidence, but uh, what you said, I'm sorry, Ted. Well, I was just going to say the evidence that he p- suggested, Alex, that you may have missed going back and forth to MCE was that, you know, the dosing is supposedly higher to actually cause the respiratory depression in the future that we use if, of course, we dose properly, which is not always the case. But the problem is, is that we don't have evidence that way because we never use it that way. So that means that the evidence wouldn't it would have to be something maybe we would do here if we decide to do an ambulatory because they're not ambulatory yet. So that's part of the other issue is that other than you getting them off your dashboard from being the bariatrics champion with um, the APPs and yourself and others, there's no way to know that data and we'd need a study. And Dan pointed out that the dosing is all over the map. So that's kind of the problem. And and a lot of that has to do with the in-room providers not necessarily feeling confident with it. Um, I try to be more aggressive with method. I think I, I specifically wrote 10 as an introductory dose for the bariatric patients, knowing it was deliberately underdosed mm-hmm. with room to be able to redose it at mm-hmm. the end or in the PACU. Um, but I still find even hesitation using 10 in the bariatric population, even though I, I think 20 is a reasonable dose to start with. I, I think so too. Although I will say, given that it is a laparoscopic surgery, you may not need the same amount as you would in larger surgeries. I the, the ambulatory surgery study came back at 0.15 mix per cake for ideal body weight. For the average person that if we say the average person is a 70 kilo person um, who that is their normal body weight, you would come away with about 10. You know, so based on all that you guys brought up, I, I wonder a question for everybody on this call is, is the idea that most of the studies definitely point to pre-incisional being a better choice. Mm-hmm. And, you know, sometimes when I'm doing these cases, I actually give it an induction, right? I might as well, because if I want it to work and I don't want them to have respiratory depressive effects, the further away from the end of the surgery, the better. So do most of you on this call, and maybe just raise your hand in the chat if you're not on it, do you do it pre-incisional on induction, which is probably the easiest? See if we see any hands. I tried to write that. I tried to write that in the bariatric protocol. To have so I see incision. Dr. Wolf said it. I'm just looking for other people. But so we got one hand in there. Dr. Uh, Dr. Donald, Dr. Sachs. Okay, Dr. Shams, we <laughs> Dr. McCann. So yeah, there are people. Okay. Yeah. And I think that that may be one of the things that, and there's Dr. Clemens. Some people are adding their names in there. I think that that's kind of the key is um, dosing aside. When I was a resident back in the dinosaur age, I remember the one thing that the attendees used to tell us is if you dose up front and the case takes two or three hours, almost everything will go away so that you can at least extubate the patient. Now, there it sounds so simple, but it's not that far from the truth when you think about the ironic way we wake patients up and and especially with laparoscopy now versus like a big open incision. Anyway, I just thought I'd bring that up because it's a great question and you guys had alluded to it. Any other questions? Other participant number 29, is is that an uh, answer to you do bariatrics or? Okay, no, I think everybody, okay. Any other questions? I don't, can y'all hear me? Yes, we can, yeah. Dr. Donald. Okay, I just wanted to comment, Dan, thank you for that great presentation. It was excellent. I just wanted to comment um, for our residents in particular that when you are converting from, um, you can you can make your conversion from methadone or from morphine to methadone. Um, using the numbers that you gave, um, but when you're con- you're trying to figure out how many morphine equivalents a person is taking if they're taking methadone, you can't go the opposite way. So um, it is practically impossible to give an, right. a morphine mill equivalent to somebody who's taking methadone. So um, I just want to make sure everybody's aware of that. It doesn't go. It's not a bidirectional uh, math. So one more time, Dr. Donald, you said you can go from methadone to morphine, but not say that again, no. just so everybody. Other, yeah, other way, you can go from okay. morphine equivalents to methadone, but you cannot go from methadone to morphine equivalents. Yeah, so you can't go backwards. You can't right. take their dose that they come it, in on. And is, is that only for oral, Rebecca? Is that true for IV No, as that's well? just true for IV as well. Okay. All right. Well, thank yeah. you. Dr. Clemens, did you have a question or did you lower your hand knowing that we were done with that other question? Uh, no, sir, I don't have any questions. Dr. Okay. Shams did a good job answering all of mine. 
All right. Well, thank you all. And uh, we will see you back in two weeks at the yep. same time at four o'clock for uh, Dr. Schweitzer. Thank you, Dr. Shams. And all of you have a nice evening. Take care. Thank you, everybody.